we are celebrating our 10th anniversary, that is, Science Circle is. Um, but actually, the idea of Science Circle was a year earlier. And I'll talk a little bit about that. The very first presentation that was recognized in the Science Circle was in March 2008, called the Anthropocene Epic. And I was honored to give that. And so 10 years later, I'm going to revisit the topic. Uh, obviously, 10 years later, a lot has come up, and it's not quite as simple as simply uh, carbon dioxide or um, temperatures or other things. There's a lot going on. Any animal or plant that breathes, lives, dies, affects the earth, but uh, the real issue is how much it affects. And so uh, let's take a look at what we mean by the Anthropocene epic. We need to start by looking at what's happened to the Earth. Um, here again, it's been 10 years, it's hard to imagine. And I think there may be some people who were here 10 years ago. I know di has been here a long time. Uh, there may have been others. Um, way back then, in 2007, Sean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was here too. Um, Chantel started a, by the way, we didn't know each other's names back there, so I had no idea what her name was until about 2010. No one her, had heard voices uh, until then, because if you'll remember in the summer of 2010, or maybe not, if you have not been in Second Life that long, uh, voices came in. And that was very controversial because voices can betray a lot of things. It can betray where you're from. It can betray gender and age and lots of things. And we started a science circle board in the summer. And Chantal wanted to make sure that uh, people who presented were who they said they were. Um, yes, some refused, exactly. And, and this day, some still will not reveal their real name or uh, anything else about them or talk. Um, and that was the first time I'd heard Sean's voice too. So it was very interesting. It's only been that long. Now, back in uh, 2007 to 2008, we had several things going on. We had a philosophy forum and then it branched off to a science uh, forum called NIMP Science Forum. And then to NIMPS Science Circle, and then finally to the cir Science Circle. And last year in the summer, we started a nonprofit organization, which is known as the Science Circle Foundation. So it's come a long way. Uh, I've got the names there of the people who attended uh, the very first presentation. Uh, and it was kind of, instead of uh, people talking, because there was no talking back then, uh, we had a discussion and had some rules about how to discuss and there were a there was a moderator itzy um Fredericks. so that was what it was 10 years ago let's take a look then about this topic 10 years later over to the right um i happened to find the actual slides that i had from march 2008 i've got the names and the transcript and the whole bit and so I'm including the slides from uh, 10 years ago from the presentation I did back then. Uh, they were about that size. We didn't have big presentation boards. And they were somewhat whimsical, and I did them, uh, drew things myself. So uh, I think it would be interesting. Now, how have we around the world viewed the Earth's history? Well, it depends on where you ask. In some cases, the Earth has been thought of as always being here. And in other cases, it's been cyclic. In other words, in the Americas, in uh, parts of uh, Asia, the Earth's history was viewed as cycles. In other words, there was Earths that were created and then destroyed, and then another created and destroyed, and uh, some by fire, some by flood, some by other uh, means. And so how old the earth was, it was not necessarily a question uh, for some cultures. Um, in the case that I have up here, I've written the Cheyenne one. And if you look, 
that's probably a hybrid between Christian history or Judeo-Christian uh, earth creation myths and the Cheyenne people. It's kind of an interesting one, I think. So I put that up there. You'll also notice that in the West, sometimes we become interested in a kind of a linear history and when exactly things were instead of kind of accepting uh, things. And so in 1654, a gentleman bishop uh, named Usher actually looked at the version or the translation of the Christian Bible, the, the Western Christian Bible that was being, that he was looking at. And he reasoned from the text that earth began at nightfall, in other words, around 6 p.m. on the 22nd of October, 4004 BC. Now we can talk calendars and such uh, as far as that being an anachronism, uh, BC in particular, not being invented until about 600 AD, <laughs> but whatever. Um, it was a little, it was fairly precise. We may want to uh, re-examine that as far as hold the earth was. Well, once we started digging in the earth, uh, there wasn't always a reason to dig in the earth. You know, you built buildings, you had salt mines in the old days. Uh, people dig, dug for metals. And they may have discovered things. Yes, they, ooh, yes, good. Uh, please, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I often present on topic, topics where I'm not an expert because I like to do research, but I kind of have read a lot on a lot of stuff. <laughs> so um, there's my slide up in the upper hand. One of the uh, kind of rules, so to speak, is that the deeper you dig, uh, the older the area is. In the case of the Grand Canyon, which has been revealed uh, through a combination of uh, erosion and uplift, you've got rocks which have been dated back to a billion and a half years. There's other rocks on Earth that are showing part of the early cratons or early parts of the continental um, rocks, the gran granite-type rocks instead of salty rocks. And in Canada and Australian places and in Africa that are much older, two or three a billion years old. But as we dug, we found that, yeah, and that, that's uh, a qualify. In other words, Virginia is part of the Appalachian area and places have been flipped up by uh, down and uh, same thing in uh, Rockies and other places where great tectonic uh, movements and uplift and volcan volcanism. In general, uh, the deeper you dig, oh, you okay, good. Um, the uh, earlier and the earlier the creatures and plants, and sometimes we, we would find things, uh, and I'm saying we during history would find things that obviously didn't belong, and so people would say, oh, monsters and other th things, and it wasn't until fairly recent that a systematic plan created as to, uh, in the 1800s in particular, as, and then uh, dated as to how far back we're looking. Okay, so um, if, and then we found, gracious, uh, the Earth is a whole lot older than we thought. There's been different ways to represent that. Uh, I like the one on the left because it's spiral and it, you can see that the Earth is, was very, very old even before the very first living things, or at least the very first living things other than for uh, one-celled organisms, things we could see anyway. Uh, um, it's only been a, a few hundred years, or a few, excuse me, a few hundred million years that uh, there's been living things on land and things we would recognize. You can, and then uh, another way of looking at it is that arm and hand down there. If you look at your arm, and you stretch out to your fingernails, most of what we know um, is like the very tip of your fingernail. Uh, it wasn't even, you have to get all the way to your hand there before even multicellular organisms. Now, if you look at the bars, I'm going to play with those for a second. If you look at the bars on the ground, 
These were the original props I used for the presentation in March 2008. I found, courtesy of Linden Lab, they don't get rid of inventory, so I found them in my inventory. And the bar in the back, the one I'm moving right now, that one, the scale is one meter equals 500 million years. And so to the far left there, uh, that's the Hadean period where the earth was really hot and then it cooled down a little bit. And so the green period at the far end uh, was really about um, the last big era. And I, so the next little bar there is one meter equals uh, five, excuse me, uh, 50 million years. So you're still talking about a long period of time. Uh, these contained plate, uh, eras or, or periods which we recognize, things like the Jurassic and the Mesozoic and, and, and stuff. Here again, if I say the wrong words, correct me. Um, I like this, but I'm not an expert in it. And then finally, the very last period there, uh, one meter equals five million years. See right on the very end, that gray area to the right is the area that we, we would recognize. Uh, these are ones like the, um, let's see, what is it? Um, Eocene and the Miocene and ones where you've got basically the birds and then the mammals ruling uh, the world. Okay. Okay. What were the natural changes? In other words, the world's changed a lot. There was one time when the world was completely covered by ice, what we call the uh, snowball earth. There was other times in the very early period of the earth where there was no oxygen. And it took a long time for the photosynthetic organisms to create oxygen. And really, it's been fairly recently since uh, oxygen was in the quantities we see today. And as uh, one of our members pointed out uh, in the first presentation this morning, uh, we had up to 30% oxygen at one time, and they were huge insects that were able to live in that super rich oxygen environment, up to like four foot long centipedes and huge dragonflies and such that could bring oxygen through their skin. Here again, if I say something wrong biologically, let me know as well. Um, and then as the oxygen decreased a little bit, uh, they had to get smaller. Um, but if you look at through his, or history, you'll see that the natural changes that have made the most difference are things like plate tectonics. Actually, in Snowball Earth, uh, the reason why it warmed up again was because of volcanism uh, from plate tectonics. Uh, lava has played, a, a big lava fields have played a, an enormous um, role in extinctions, uh, particularly the Deccan field in uh, India and uh, vast lava fields in Siberia and other places have affected the atmosphere and the temperatures and played a, a large role. Um, a little smaller time scale, but no less important, particularly for the Ice Ages, uh, have been the fact that the Earth's orbit is not circular, and the fact that the Earth's uh, tilt is uh, variable. Uh, the Moon has helped a lot to keep the Moon's tilt from becoming too radically different, like some of the planets we see in our solar system. Right now, it's 23 and a half degrees, but it does vary um, more and less, and that allows more sun to reach the poles or the equator. Uh, if it were, if we were had no tilts at all, you can imagine that the poles would be really cold and the equator would be too hot to live, and so have two areas, basically the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, where there was no. Uh, exchange basically biologically that would have created an enormous change in the earth um so those are some natural variations uh in or, or natural causes for variation in uh the earth's history um however animals have and plants have done have contributed a huge amount a lot more than humans have um 
as I mentioned, photosynthetic singular organisms, which are represented by the stromatolites that you find fossilized in Australia in particular and in other parts of the world, were responsible, primarily responsible for uh, bringing us oxygen and turning the sky from basically uh, reddish to the bluish we see today and creating large deposits of iron that we find in the ground. Um, so oxygen cycle, carbon cycle, um, plants. Now, can anyone, here again, I want to make sure everybody's awake out there because so, uh, I don't see any chatting. So can you think of any plants or animals today that affect the earth more than humans? Yeah, okay. Anyone's, yeah, bees. Okay, very good. Bees, plankton for sure. Plank, there's a, if we didn't have plankton, we would be in a heck of a trouble. You <laughs> could be people, people for sure. I'll be talking about that in a minute. But if we, if we have to talk, or if we talk about the Anthropocene epic, that is how humans affect it, we need to talk about everything involved. It's much more sophisticated. How about ants? Ants are on almost every millimeter of soil in the world. Uh, large animals produce a lot of methane um, as a byproduct of eating. The uh, bacteria, of course, uh, both nitrogen fixing and other bacteria and, and single cell organisms make up a large part of life in the soil. And we are part of our ecology. Roaches? <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, roaches actually would die off pretty quickly if humans die. I don't know if anyone saw the special on... Um, about what happens if humans disappeared. Things like roaches wouldn't be around for too long. Yeah, I know, roaches. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, termites, there's a lot of um, interesting animals that uh, play a, a large part. Obviously, the huge forests and things and the carbon sumps, basically. The ocean itself uh, is able to absorb a lot of carbon and such. So. It's no more Twinkies. Well, that's very funny. If anybody saw the movie Wally, uh, I thought it was very funny that the little cockroach uh, was around and uh, bur burrowed through a Twinkie. And that seemed to be the only food left on Earth. Uh, it's very funny that they decided to pick that. So uh, these were some of my slides. If we think about it, it's only been the last few hundred million years that we've had plants and animals and such. And so uh, here's a few slides to depict uh, that time period. Uh, essentially, you've got plants and animals inhabiting the land, changing the atmosphere a lot. Uh, plants and animals dying um, and creating coal and oil deposits that we would later use uh, for fuel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, these, these are whimsical drawings, which I made back for the March 2008 presentation. So I hope you like them. Um, <laughs> and and mass, mass extinctions. There's been really about six or seven uh, extinctions where almost 90% of the world's uh, life has disappeared. In fact, actually, even for the dinosaur one, like the one that says, uh-oh, the world was having some problems back there anyway. But when the asteroid hit, we had a big asteroid hit in the area of what it is now, uh, Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, around 67. Yeah. Oh, I haven't read that one. I'll have to take a look. But, uh, and it was large enough to create essentially what we called a nuclear winter or what would be similar to a nuclear winter. And uh, everything above five kilograms uh, died. And luckily, at that time, our ancestors' mammals uh, were below five kilograms, as were some birds and other animals to survive. And after the dinosaurs, the birds took over, and then the mammals after that. And it's, it's really been fairly recently that uh, humans have come into existence. Now, usually when we talk about changes like the Anthropocene, we talk about greenhouse gases and temperature. So let me talk about that a little bit because it's important, but it's not the only way that we're 
changing the planet. Not the only way that you can see uh, evidence of humans uh, rivaling or paralleling uh, natural causes. So carbon dioxide uh, has been going up. Uh, heating has been going up. Now, bear in mind that uh, if you look at the upper left, you'll see that temperatures have uh, changed quite a bit over a long period of time, thousands of years here. Uh, we've been coming out of a little ice age uh, back when a couple hundred years ago or a few hundred years ago. It was a lot colder in Europe. Um, back a few thousand years ago, or particularly in the beginning of the agricultural time period, uh, it was much warmer. And that's how uh, once the ice age, um, uh, the ice in Europe and the, the permanent uh, big uh, ice sheets uh, melted, uh, then people were able to extend into that area and the Sahara got wetter. And so we've been coming out of some of these periods. And so it's been become uh, warmer and more carbon dioxide and such. But you have to remember how fast things are happening. That's one of the keys, by the way, is how fast things are Yes, we've had more carbon dioxide. Yes, it's been warmer, all that. But do you really want to return to the carbonific? Yes, and we'll talk about that in a second, what that means. But do you really want to return to the swamps of the time periods with the big insects or the way the Earth looked when the dinosaurs were here? Uh, if we did return to those periods where there are either more oxygen or less oxygen, temperature or carbon dioxide, essentially the plants and animals uh, – that exists today could not exist in those time periods. And that's really the message here. It's not, yes, the earth was different in times past, but we're making, we're cha making changes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, if there were cats, which I guess there were um, relationships later uh, to cats, uh, relatives. But, but the idea is that we don't want to, there's a lot of uh, plants and animals today which are very sensitive to things like ocean acidity, temperature, and we don't necessarily want to ourselves make those changes that fast. Yeah, cats are big enough to eat students, and also to rival birds. I was watching something where the uh, uh, saber-toothed tigers came in, and at that time the birds were the nasty big animals, and the saber-toothed tigers could finally take them on. Um, Yes. Yeah, we don't want big snakes like that. Uh, carbon dioxide right now is about what it was uh, 20 million years ago. Do we really want to return to some of those time periods? So let's take a look then, um, not necessarily at temperature and carbon dioxide, but basically how are humans affecting the Earth? Well, this gentleman here, uh, Paul Crutzen, and a Dutch Nobel Prize winning atmospheric scientist uh, proposed. Now, he's one of the first one to propose this. Uh, people back in, well, that's a very good question. Does it affect the genes? And uh, we'll take a look at that. Um, but in any case, uh, Paul Crutzen, uh, he wasn't the first person. There were people in the 1800s that go, wow, we are really doing a number on uh, the Earth. But uh, Paul Crutzen in 2002 in a in prestigious uh, magazine or journal, uh, Nature, proposed that we were not only impacting the Earth, because like I said, everything impacts the Earth. Uh, early humans impacted North America and Russia and places by eliminating most of the megafauna. Um, in other words, the big animals. Uh, and that definitely affected things. But there weren't quite as many humans back at that time period. But today, our population is uh, growing. It's doubled at least since I was born, and it's continuing to grow, and we're continuing to impact the Earth more with technology as, as uh, countries become richer. A lot of the Asian countries now, large, large populations, general um, population is becoming wealthier and becoming consumer societies, just like the West has been for a long time, and that's affecting things. You can see that in China most recently with their economy uh, booming uh, with uh, uh, car pollution and other 
things, although they've gone to a more sustainable um, energy sources. But in any case, he proposed that uh, uh, Kutzen. Oh, okay. Um, Crutzen suggested uh, that we not only were impacting the earth, but we were impacting the earth as much as natural causes. Now, somebody suggested that we, it ought to be called, instead of necessarily Anthropocene, but at least the Great Acceleration. That is, we are as much of an effect uh, of uh, things changing right now as nature. But then, if we want to call it, instead of the Holocene, if we want to call this the Anthropocene epoch, how do we know it's changing? In other words, a million years from now, whoever is on the Earth, whether it's humans or the next um, intelligent uh, species, um, how could they know we were here? Well, uh, I think it was Day, Miami, back uh, in the early part of uh, our conversation, here that suggested that it ought to be called the plastis, plasticine or, or plasticine. And that's really a, one of the ways I have a feeling there'll be plastics around for a long time, styrofoam plastics. So somebody will be looking at the earth and go, wow, look at this layer. Uh, all of a sudden, there's a lot of plastic here. Um, but when, when would people be able to de detect uh, our changes? Well, what about the beginning of Agriculture. What about industrial age? In other words, detecting uh, large quantities of carbon dioxide in the ice fields uh, that come from the 1800s and into the 1900s. What about the first atomic test? Some people have said that you can definitely uh, detect uranium uh, in the atmosphere worldwide. And so it will also occur in the rock layers uh, the same way as, um, does anyone, okay, here again, this is the, who's awake out there? Well, yeah, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, particularly if, if we don't do anything about it, um, unless that's our plan is to, is to make the earth um, incompatible for the species that, uh, living right now. Um, but does anyone remember the name of the, element that was a telltale sign of a big asteroid hitting the Earth back 67 million years ago. You can find it uh, throughout a layer all the way through it. Yeah, yay. I think it was Michael last time, early today, that said that. Yes, yeah. And those are not very common on Earth, but, you, but they are more common in that asteroid than you can tell. Ah, okay. Yeah, my first... Um, Agree with it's chemistry, and I remember the Alvarez uh, father son team, which was very interesting because one was a physicist and one was a um, a geologist or whatever, and they got together and they go, "Oh my goodness, this explains that." Very cool. Okay, so what I find kind of hard to believe is why people don't find it difficult to understand that we are changing the world. I mean, everything changes, the winds change, it, etc. But we are also changing it to a degree that we're rivaling nature or perhaps um, changing it more than nature does as well. Yeah, that's going to become an interesting problem. Actually, the space debris, they've got proposed missions to go up and try to get rid of some of that. I think China has one, for example. And yes, of course, if you go up into space, uh, you would see lights. Um, from the cities and, and fires and lights where they're fishing out in the ocean and such. Uh, if you go over to the moon, you'd see evidence of humans. If you go to Mars, you'd see evidence of humans. Uh, not to mention the little spacecrafts that have left the sun's um, gravity. Okay, so let's take a look then at back uh, 10 years ago, I was suggesting some of the types of evidence that we have for, um, yes, yes, we are. And that's absolutely true. In other words, what we're looking at is we are nature. I guess what I'm saying is not that, is that humans are rivaling the natural causes other than human activity. In other words, uh, if you didn't have humans and you compared changes, you'd see that 
we were accelerating some of those changes, even though, of course, those changes are going on. In other words, coming out of the ice age, which was caused by one of the, uh, or contributed to by one of those cycles, that sort of thing. Uh, but we are indeed um, changing things to a degree. Now, how are we changing things? Well, one of the, here are, are several instances. Uh, one of the things that Europe should be concerned about is that why is Europe warm in general? Uh, one of our speakers, uh, or one of the members in the first presentation mentioned that it had snowed in Rome for the first time in a while. So individual, what we have to remember is that there's a lot of variability on Earth. I, and uh, SR mentioned the idea of global warming. Well, what does global warming mean? Uh, let me ask a question for the audience. Does global warming mean it's getting warmer everywhere on Earth? Ah, I hear people. Yeah, that's right. In other words, what really we should say is global warming is an average increase. In other words, uh, di yes, good. Okay, differential warming. In other words, in some places like the poles, it's definitely getting warmer than it has been in the past. In other areas, it's getting drier. In other areas, it's getting uh, uh, wetter. In other areas, it's, it's actually cooling a little bit. But overall, if you, yes, overall, yes, you're correct, all of those. Um, well, not for long. In other words, you have to kind of look at some of the um, areas where it's actually getting a tiny bit cooler, but overall it's getting warmer. In other words, if you were to take the temperature of the earth, it's getting warmer. Now, in one of, in uh, older houses without um, good insulation, the thermostat, if I mean the heater uh, or air conditioning may be in the middle, and Rooms that are uh, have more sun uh, beating on the roof may be warmer, and then other parts of the room may be cooler. And but in general, the thermostat, if you look at what the temperature is in the house, that's the average temperature in the house. Uh, the same thing. Yes, uh, and Lyle, you guys are all doing uh, having some excellent. Um, now, by the way, with the Maldives and other things, you have to remember that one of the things that happens when the ocean gets warmer is that um, the sea levels uh, rise not only because the ice melts in Antarctica and Greenland and in stuff, but remember the ice that's on top of the water is not going to increase the um, level of the ocean. It's the grounded ice. It's the ice that's coming off of the of the land that's going to increase the uh, sea level. And it's increasing slowly, but it's increasing more because the water is also heating up. And as water heats up, it will increase in volume. That's contributing to it. Yeah, tornado in Germany, as you mentioned, which is really unusual. Now, I live in Texas. Tornadoes here are pretty uh, common. I mean, they're scary, but they're pretty common. We had one last year right in the middle of our city, and it's about people in the city. Um, and so the idea is that overall it's getting warmer. And let's, let me, in fact, let me show you the next slide for a second and then go back. But on the next slide, the last 400 months in a row on Earth have been warmer than the average in the 20th century. That's something interesting to be said. Let me, in fact, let's take a look at some of the things on this page and then I'll go back. Is one of the things that you don't hear much is the idea of overpopulation. When I was younger, when I was in college, for example, in the 70s, um, overpopulation was uh, mentioned a lot. And we don't hear it very much, but like I said, the population on Earth is twice what it was when I was born, and it tends to pressure uh, the areas around it. We have many more cities and people living in cities, areas where uh, overpopulation is a problem or, or population rate is a problem, uh, where they can't support the population. That becomes a, quite a 
a bit of a issue because you start running out of food and water and uh, pressures of population. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, plastic is a real issue and runoff. We've got areas of the middle of the Pacific that are almost the size of the United States that are filled with microplastics. You just have to dip a cup of water in the ocean and uh, put it under a microscope and you can see microplastics. Yeah, uh, well, now, Day, you, this, is, this is a trippy, tricky topic. Why, for example, should people in India or China with large populations not be able to drive cars and do everything else that people in the West have? The problem is with large populations like that, unless they're smarter than a lot of the Western countries, they're going to run into bigger problems because of the larger populations and they're going to be able, they're going to add to the uh, pollution in the air. And so basically uh, some of the countries there um, can, as they become wealthier, uh, they'll have to make more and smarter choices um, than um, people like, say, for example, in the United States where I live. Um, Habitats are disappearing as we spread out. Um, countries also have larger impacts. Let me show you what those maps mean. If you take a look at the maps on this page, they're kind of distorted. But the map up at the other, here again, I'm going to ask you a question here. Map up at the upper right represents population, not size of country. So which Areas there do you see with most population? Yeah, uh, for one, the large green area. This is just one of my um, teacher moments here where I have to make sure everybody's awake. <laughs> China, Africa in the middle, um, a little bit of Europe and Indonesia and the Americas and such. But yes, now that, yes, take a look at that. SR has a very good point is that now take a look at the map at the bottom right and you will see the impact of each nation based on how much they consume and uh, their carbon footprint. If you'll notice that India is not, the largest carbon footprint, even with the large population. You'll notice that, for example, China with its uh, exploding uh, economy is starting to make a big difference. Um, U.S. is making a tremendous difference. So, for example, in the U.S., if we decide not to play with others as far as helping out with uh, the carbon footprint, uh, it can make an enormous difference. Um, here again, if you actually look at that, you'll see that the U.S. alone can make the difference of almost like four planets. Uh, and Europe as well. In other words, um, <laughs> that's, that's kind of funny. Uh, Texas, of course, makes an enormous difference because of the amount of oil. Um, I think right now, I think oil, uh, so I heard something about uh, Texas um, uh, creating more oil than almost any other place on Earth right now. Um, and uh, Texas is the size of France, uh, so it does make a huge difference. Uh, California, for example, has the fifth largest economy in the world, right behind U.S., um, China, and Japan. Um, so, yeah. Yes, each of these uh, areas makes a tremendous difference. Now, let's let's also take a look then at some of the other ways that we are affecting uh, the Earth. We mean humans. And remember, of course, we are part of nature. It's just that humans have a capacity to affect the natural order of things more. Uh, polar ice melting uh, and jeopardizing coastal cities and and. Remember that when the pole ice melts, particularly in the north, um, what happens is that in, since it's not white anymore and 
can't bounce the radiation back. It essentially then goes into the oceans there, so it heats up even faster with the polar ice gone. Not to mention, of course, uh, problems with animals that live up there and people that live up there, polar bears and the Inuit and, and um, native peoples in Russia and stuff. Um, GDP and population. Yeah, I would say that if you kind of like multiply GDP and population, I think it has a multiplicative effect. It'd have um, kind of impact. That's that's approximately, but that's all based on what decisions we make. In other words, if you make uh, good decisions about how you impact things, just because you're wealthy doesn't necessarily mean you have to waste things. Uh, would be better off. Notice that uh, th things like mangrove swamps, things we might not even think about, are being destroyed and they have uh, large um, implications for the ecology in that area. Uh, extinction rates in rainforests are a thousand to ten thousand times the natural rate that we have that we have seen over time. Um, global warming, or let's just say climate climate change um, is intensifying storms and rains and droughts. Yes, there you go. Second, we have statistics of, yeah. And SR, you're, you're correct. And India ha can play an enormous role uh, right now in what kind of decisions are made, okay? In other words, do you go down the same path that everybody else has? Or can you make decisions which are um, affect the earth and yet uh, allow people in India to reap the benefits. Yeah, planet family, re reap the benefits of becoming wealthier. Um, it, it's, it's a big choice. Uh, migration and growing cycles. Remember that that's important. In a lot of times, the temperatures and the where they can, where people, or excuse me, where plants or where animals and birds and stuff can find uh, food can change things greatly. Sometimes they're dependent on each other. In other words, you have birds which migrate hoping to find food in different places, but if the temperature changes and such, then they have to uh, change their migration cycles. Uh, they, there's a lot of... Um, interweaving effects. Uh, it can also affect uh, food crops uh, for humans as well as for animals. Okay, that's good. That's good. Here again, uh, it's important for countries with large populations um, in Asia, Africa, uh, um, in particular to make smart choices in the future. Um, ocean production. We we know that acidity in the ocean is killing coral reefs, which are a huge ecological uh, niche, important uh, place. Um, also, sea creatures like plankton that have carbonate exoskeletons. Um, remember also that uh, warming of... Um, I'm trying to think of the word. Um, what's the frozen ground called? A tundra. <laughs> okay. But yeah, permafrost. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah, tundra and permafrost. Remember that there's a lot of methane uh, trapped in there. Same thing with the seabeds. As the ocean is warm, as this area is warm, we're going to release methane, which is a much more potent greenhouse gas, and it's going to have a huge effect on how the temperature increases. Yep, uh, absolutely. Uh, and we know that right now. We've we've seen that. So the idea is um, that when we talk about the Anthropocene epoch, the first thing we have to understand is that anything living, eating, breathing, uh, pooping, reproducing, whatever, has an impact on Earth, but how much? In the case of humans, we can change our impact if we choose. We can also have an enormously negative impact or nor enormous uh, impact which is negative to our uh, current ecology um, or even our own way of life. 
Uh, but this is all a, a choice. Um, yes, there are natural processes going on, but if you'll notice what humans are doing, we're changing things in the order of decades or centuries, it's not a thousand years, 10,000, 100,000, millions of years. And we don't really know how that's going to impact the earth. All we know is that it's happening slower than some people view uh, so that uh, they don't see the changes. Um, there's a analogy, and I don't know how universal it is, but it's the idea of the frog in the boiling pot of water. Anybody know about that? Yeah, and that basically, SR, if we were to go to, say, for example, instead of oil-based plastics, we were to go to um, other biodegradable plastics or other ones made of uh, materials, uh, um, cellulose-based, excellent. Uh, if we were to go to some of those based ones, we would be far better off. And we would um, use less uh, fossil fuels and such. Pectin-based, uh, the, exactly. There's some good uh, studies on both of those. Okay. okay, and I think I asked a question in there, but I forgot the question I asked. <laughs> frog! Yes, okay. So does everybody know the, the, the uh, thing about the frog in water? I have a feeling it's it's kind of a story. It's not a real thing because... I don't think it would work, uh, frankly. But the idea with the frog is that if you throw a frog, of course, don't do this at home. Uh, if you throw, throw a frog in boiling water, it will hop out. Great. Okay. But if you slowly raise the water under the frog, it might uh, be boiling before the frog realizes it's boiling. Well, that, that analogy is used uh, for the global climate change as well. In other words, people go, ah, you know, agree here, degree that. It's not really doing this because, hey, it snowed in Rome or it uh, was really hot or whatever. But if you look at it over time, over decades or century, you'll see that, yes, indeed, it is getting warmer. That's what the average global warming Yes, In some places, it's uh, the climate is changing. And uh, do we have to have it uh, basically beyond our of uh, fixing things. Uh, right now, I don't think we can fix things. I think that we're stuck with the uh, carbon dioxide and we can simply limit how hot it does get and how soon it gets. Yes, it has. Uh, it has happened many times in the geological timeline. But remember, do we want to go back to those timelines? Can the critters today and the plants and stuff live uh, in the timelines or with that much carbon dioxide, that much heat, that much oxygen, that sort of thing. Do we want a world where the plants and animals we know today, including our food crops, cannot live? Uh, do we want our coastal cities to be underwater? Um, do we want places that humans can uh, support millions of people now to be uninhabitable? Like they're talking about the Mideast, for example. Um, those are the types of things we need to be asking. Yes, indeed, it has happened many, many times, but do we want to cause it? We want it to accelerate uh, those things that will happen in the past and will happen in the future. Yeah, and that's the part of the issue. And even if it hasn't been as severe, uh, do we want to change our world to where we can't live in place in certain places or our, our food crops can't support the uh, millions of people? Exactly. Uh, now, of course, there's always a way for the Earth to regulate its population. And that's for people to die, um, which may happen if we run out of water, or food and stuff. That may not be the way we want to regulate population. We can also regulate them through war. Um, this may, again, not be the way we want to go. So here again, uh, we are changing things. And um, yeah, you're right. The planet is going to be, be here, and at least for a billion years. They figure a billion years from now, I think the sun is going to 
become warm enough to uh, boil off oceans and such. And so it's going to be uninhabitable anyway. But a million years is a long time. And we certainly don't want it to happen uh, within our the, the lifetimes of, you know, our great, great grandkids. Uh, and, you know, right now we don't know of any place to go. I mean, I suppose you can go live on Mars, but Mars is not as habitable as this place. And it certainly can't support uh, seven or eight billion people. So we have options and <laughs> some of the options uh, are not as good as others. Balloons on Venus, I've heard that one well. Uh, very costly options in some cases. Um, it would be a whole lot less costly if we simply made some eco-friendly decisions right now. So that's kind of the discussion that I have for today. The big part of the discussion today is um, we are making changes. Yes, there are natural, thank you, there are natural things going on and they're going to go on. And because we've got uh, cycles in plate tectonics, we've got cycles like, like for example, about, uh, let's see, it wasn't that long ago, about 5 million years, that the Mediterranean was dry. It was, uh, it had, there was no um, opening at Gibraltar, and the whole Mediterranean had dried up. Uh, many years from now, there will be a Mediterranean because the uh, Africa will slam up into Europe. Uh, now, remember in Europe that the uh, what we don't want to happen is, for example, the Gulf Stream to fail. Because the reason Europe, which is pretty far north, is as warm as it is, is because of the Gulf Stream. If we have too much uh, melt ice off of Greenland, it can affect the salinity and affect the Gulf Stream. You could have some really problems in Europe. It's going to get much older there. Things like that. Or deserts getting much drier. I mean, those are the types of things that uh, will happen if uh, and may happen. Uh, again, but do we want that to happen in our lifetimes? Yeah. Um, political action. Uh, sometimes people don't want um, to believe that things are happening, but then it's not a belief. There's evidence. Uh, I mean, you can believe whatever you want. That's fine. But uh, there's evidence to the contrary. Change is hard for for humans, and that's very, very true. We don't want to have changes going on. So many. Bye bye. Have a good day, die. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's true. And, and frankly, uh, you can expect, particularly as populations get larger and climate changes and such. There's a lot of, I've told my students, you know, the next few decades are going to be very interesting. Maybe not in the good way sometimes, maybe in, maybe in a good way. Maybe we'll all, there'll be um, revolutions te technologically, revolutions socially uh, that are positive. I'm, I'm not too happy about the 21st century so far, uh, just like the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, if you go by that calendar, obviously there's different calendars too, but um, yeah, and definitely will increase conflicts if we act as a team. Um, the EU is one of the best uh, examples of uh, team effort where people were fighting each other only a century ago and now people are cooperating, even though there's strains uh, there because of the different cultures. But these these are all decisions. These are all things we can choose or choose not to do. Yeah, may you live in an interesting time. Okay, so uh, it's 55 minutes in, and I'm going to call it um, a presentation. And I really appreciate I really appreciate everybody coming today. And have some cake. Celebrate. Thank you for coming.
Uh, that's a very interesting question, too. Yes. If you actually look at the sun, the sun, one of the uh, great things we've learned in the last couple hundred years is that there's almost nothing which is constant uh, or so-called perfect, like circles. The, uh, the sun is um, growing warmer the, uh, because it's aging. In other words, it's burning hydrogen. It's actually becoming a bit warmer. Uh, the moon is going away about a centimeter. I think it's a centimeter per year. In other words, the Earth day is getting longer, which means there'll be more changes. Uh, back in the dinosaur days, it was actually an hour earlier. In other words, it was only like 23 hours in a day before. Um, so, yes, there's a lot of uh, changes like that, which are making a big difference. So, sun, as I mentioned, about a billion years from now, the sun will be um, more will be redder and larger and warmer so that, yeah, red giant, so that uh, the the oceans, let's not even worry about acidity, the oceans are going to boil off. So uh, we've only got about a billion years left uh, for life, but a billion years is a long time. We can mess things up uh, long, long before then. And yes, the, the uh, subject is really large and very complicated and very important. I mean, there's no other place to live right now, and we have to be both educated and intelligent in their decisions. Yeah, and as Mike pointed out, yes, the sun's rate of change is very slow uh, to make a, a difference. There's a lot of uh, cyclic things happening a lot sooner. Um, uh, for example... Historically, we haven't had ice caps. Um, and, of course, now we do. So we're really in kind of a larger area over millions of years of a uh, series of ice ages. <laughs> yeah, in a, by the, maybe by a billion years, we'll be able to move planets or something. Who knows? or find a better planet to live. As we know, actually in my lifetime, I would love to know whether there is. Now, for, for me, I, I know there's life somewhere else. Okay? Whether there's intelligent life, uh, who knows? But there's probably planets we can go to, uh, such like that. There may be even places in the solar system we can. Uh, in my lifetime, I'd love to find out that there's something else out there that's alive other than uh, what we have on Earth. Uh, we may very well find that out on either Mars or some of the uh, big moons around Jupiter or Saturn. <laughs> well, that or they could just take us over and uh, and go, okay, you guys have messed things up. Uh, we'll just take over from here. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, and we we have found that there's ice on the uh, moon solar cap and uh, carbon dioxide ice and, and and ice up in Mars and even Mercury. <laughs> Robot orbiters. Yeah, we just had, now remember on that one, we have to be more intelligent than, than the robots too. This, it's when the AI, when we give AI uh, property of being able to think on their own and possibly to make their themselves. Yeah. So it, it should be very interesting. It's a very interesting time. Uh, think about Second Life right now. The, the big thing about Second Life is look at where everybody's from. Just in this one little section, this one time, this one day, there's people from all over the world that are represented right here. I mean, humanity has such potential, such... Uh, good things they can do. And it's just a matter of, of making those. I'm, I'm always amazed. I love coming in here and talking to you guys. And it just gives me such a, a an innovative mind. And I got I to gotta tell you, there's so many things going on in the world that you can get really disheartened, but uh, Science Circle is not one of them. <laughs> and so I encourage you to talk Amongst yourself, I encourage you to become educated on these topics. And I definitely will wrap it up now because we try to wrap it up about, yes, we try to wrap it up about an hour into the 
presentations. And I wish you guys all a great day. And there's no reason why you can't stay and talk. <laughs> I got to go. I have things I got to do. Uh, take care. I'm glad you all came today. And, and as um, Chantal just mentioned, as we continue to have presentations, come. They're great. <laughs>